Okay. Hello, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Um, this is a presentation about Drupal 8 customer project experience. Um, so, how are you feeling after so many sessions today already? Where is the energy? Here? There? Okay. So, this is me. Um, no, this is, uh, <laughs> this is the guy that uh, actually did this presentation, um, and I'm more like the copycat. Um, my name is Josef Tabernik, or Dasio. I'm originally from Austria, Vienna, so it's really exciting to be here at the first international Drupal camp in Bratislava. I'm very passionate about the community, um, and last year in August I moved to Switzerland, to Zurich, uh, to work as deputy head of technology um, at Amazy Labs. So, Amazy Labs is a 20 people Drupal shop. We only do Drupal websites in Zurich, in Switzerland. Um, but we also have the Amazy Group, which uh, basically means that we have another Am Amazy Labs office in Austin, Texas. And we're looking forward to, to grow further, um, but at a very sustainable pace. So. Yeah, I think we do awesome projects, and we are very passionate about what we do. <clears throat> so this presentation will basically be a walk through our journey. Our like we really think it's crucial to share our experiences with the Drupal community um, because constantly we learn from people like you um, what kind of modules we can use. Uh, what kind of processes we can improve to work better with our clients. Um, so we feel that we cannot only consume um, what is out there in Drupal, but we really think it's, it's important to share. Um, I would like to start this with everybody standing up. Could you please stand up for me? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So what we're going to do now is... Um, Shake our hands in the air. Uh -uh, yeah. mm, awesome. Okay, I like it. Cool. Thanks. Um, so that's just to get our brain started. Um, and what we're going to do now is identify ourselves. So if you can join me for the Flipboard, uh, I will, I will uh, identify my experience with Drupal 7. So I have like a lot of Drupal 7 experience, but I'm not the expert, like I, I mainly rely on, on my colleagues or on my uh, co-workers to have all the expertise. But I would say that over the, the, the decades, or is it like hundreds of years that we've been working with Drupal 7, um, I already have quite some experience with Drupal 7. Um, for Drupal 8, um, I would consider myself still in the very learning phase. Um, so. What we're going to do now is that you come, come here and you make your own, uh, like you put some dot somewhere here so that we can get a feel of how, how distributed the knowledge so far is. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yes, everybody. If you wanna, if you wanna hear about our journey, you have to first <laughs> fill in that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We're almost through, and I think we can see a tendency in Drupal Seven knowledge being more distributed than Drupal Eight knowledge. Um, Today we had a discussion that Drupal 8 has been uh, the topic of Drupal cons and Drupal camps for years already, but still we don't have much experience. And why is that so? Because Drupal 8 is not ready and nobody knows what to do with it. We have too little experience. Um, but I also find it interesting that there's always people that don't have as much Drupal 7 experience as others have. 
So the way that we learn Drupal 8 may be totally different for those who are new to the Drupal project and those who have a lot of experience with Drupal. Um, all right. <clears throat> so at Amazing Labs, before I joined the company, we decided to eat our own dog food and um, work on Drupal 8, not for the customer, because it's a bit scary if you don't have experience. So we, uh, we on 1st of April, we launched the Amazing Labs website on Drupal 8, which was cool. And it used the Bartik theme, so it was obviously an April's Fool joke. Um, and then, like a month after, <coughs> um, we launched the, the amazylabs.com website um, on Drupal 8 Alpha. Um, so amazylabs.com has two, two languages, and it was really interesting the way that we had to solve some problems there. So because at that stage, there was only Drupal core, a lot of stuff was broken. So we had to fix a lot of stuff in core, but we also had to find ways how to implement layouts. So rather than using panels, um, for example, we decided to uh, use views because you can use views basically as a layouting tool where you just put another view into the header or footer of the view. So you use views to create, um, to create a path or to like instead of writing hook menu on your own, um, that was a really interesting pattern for us to, to build complex layouts. We kind of attached views to each other to list services and case stories and so forth. Um, so that was really interesting. Then uh, Acquia ap approached us to, to bring in our experience with Drupal 8 for the Drupal.com website. So our team in Austin, with a lot of help from Zurich, um, took over the Drupal.com website and completely rebuilt it in Drupal 8. So that's also really interesting. It was like our first customer project where Dries is basically the customer who can decide what goes on Drupal.com and what not. Um, and we have learned a lot there. Um, because also like updating, migrations and stuff. Um, but it's really different because it only has one language. So. A um, lot of that complexity that we are really used to work with in Switzerland, uh, with having multiple languages and like co complexity in terms of multilingual, um, is really not the case in the US. So, um, what kind of a different experience there? Then um, I myself um, was really working on this project with with the whole team, and it was uh, like our first. We have a customer, um, so <coughs> the, the Schweizer Gemeinnützige Gesellschaft, and we already built a various Drupal 7 websites for them. And then they approached us with a project where they wanted Drupal, uh, they just wanted this kind of basic brochure website with a, a kind of a boring print design. Um, so we internally discussed, like, should we really do it? It's not, so, I don't know, like, we didn't really like that project so much, but then we found out, yeah, we can like build it in Drupal 8, and then we were like all super excited. So, um, but the the cool thing about this project was that we estimated it in Drupal 7, and we delivered it in Drupal 8 uh, with no more cost. Uh, even not, we didn't have to um, build stuff on our own. So that was really cool. Like, it was very much tailored to the Drupal core use case where we already knew that, okay, we can use content types for all of that. We have to find some solution for the front page. Um, but there was not much complexity. So um, basically, this gave us a lot of confidence that given the right scope of the project, uh, we with Drupal 8 can already b build a tool um, that satisfies both the customer needs and the company needs in terms of um, billable hours and yeah, like a successful project in the end. Um, so that was in January 2015. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, one like we kind of built it just in three weeks, basically over Christmas, um, and it has four languages. Um, yeah, went live and it was pretty nice. Then. Um, just recently, the Maisie group, like 
So Amazing Labs is part of the Amazing Group, where there's also Amazing Metrics, which focuses on uh, SEO and uh, web analytics. Um, so on top of that, we have the Amazing Group, and we just launched our own uh, group website based on Drupal 8. That was in May. Uh, and SPB, like the, the Swiss rail service, um, they have kind of a challenging project. So at Amazing Labs, we really like to do complex corporate websites with lots of countries, multilingual stuff, crazy workflows. But we also kind of tend to um, like the voice of Switzerland or um, the Die größten Schweizer Talente, which are more like fancy websites, which are like more appealing. So we also um, do a lot of that. And that's definitely in that kind of category where the website is not very complex, but it has to be nice and shiny and still multilingual and editable workflow. So it's not really a use case where you just throw up HTML on the site. You still want to have all the content management capabilities. Um, so we just launched it on 1st of June. Um, uh, yeah, Gotaldo is the, na the latest website and it has like millions of traffic. It's also a really good showcase for us to know that uh, we can deliver something scalable. At least, uh, I mean, in this case, it's, it's varnish sitting in front, so it's probably not, not the big showcase of scalability, but it works. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so, and we're currently working on more. So as you have seen, we have already built a couple of sites. Um, now I think um, we can already finish the discussion by saying, cool, bring us your projects and then we will do them for you. <laughs> no, no, we, we wanna share how, how it's working. Um, and you, you maybe have some questions. Um, <clears throat> and the main question is, is it really working? Yes, it works and it's great. Like it's, Really, everybody in the company is just satisfied by the experience that we have so far. Um, there's sometimes stuff that you have to dig through, and there's rough edges, especially when doing upgrades. Um, but in general, uh, if you are creative, if you find good solutions for the problems you have, and you, if you bring in uh, all the experience, and bringing in experience is just like, with everything, we have to learn it at some point. Like the earlier we are making all those experiences ourselves, we can we can work ourselves through. So, from the team, it's actually the bad thing is nobody or people less and less want to work on Drupal Seven projects. <laughs> um, no, I, like if if they can choose, um, they really prefer to write tweak templates and build sites as we do it in Drupal Eight. <clears throat> yeah, uh, what about the editors? Like, okay, so we, we see that the team is happy, but um, then like the end user, it's not making much of a difference because the website is still shiny. We still deliver uh, the, the front end quality that we usually deliver. But the, the other person that interacts with the website is usually the client, the editors, um, and the interesting thing is, um, so we didn't really tell them. Um, and the good thing is like they didn't like, like really realize it. Like, uh, I mean, there's some parts that are maybe structured a bit differently, but in general, <coughs> it's just much better out of the box. So in Drupal 7, we have like our own new site repository where we have so many modules to to improve the editorial experience, to have Visivic functionality, to have this and that, and Drupal 8 by default already ships with a lot of improvements, um, especially the, the two columns layout of, of when editing articles is already really uh, useful. So yeah, that's cool. Um, talking about multilingual, um, in, like in Drupal 7 we, we need like, uh, you've been to Michael's talk maybe before. Um, so there you need like so many, many um, different modules in Drupal 7 and in Drupal 8. Everything is translatable out of, out of the box and it's just much cleaner. You don't have to make so many decisions. Um, so if you're a new, especially a new company that, that doesn't know how to do stuff with multilingual, 
just go for Drupal 8 if possible because it will be much easier than figuring out all the, like picking from the 200 different modules that you need in Drupal 7. It's really, really much better. Um, perfect, it's not yet. Um, so we have some issues there that um, especially caching sometimes is difficult when you have <coughs> um, stuff, but yeah, we we are working on uh, we are, like we're working together with the Drupal core issue queue um, to fix out uh, to find solution for those problems. And usually, um, so for example, Gotardo is live, so we have already fixes in place. It's just a matter of getting them committed to Drupal, to Drupal core. So um, prepare for having to adapt code or having to fix stuff yourself, having to uh, hit up the debugger um, or bring somebody into the team, maybe a consultant that already has Drupal 8 experience. Um, otherwise, you would just not be able to, um, to get it done. But that's the same for Drupal 7. I mean, if you, if you integrate functionality that you don't understand 100%, you need a developer or a consultant to be able to fix that for you. <coughs> Site building is kind of my topic. So um, it feels much more right, like all the best practices that we kind of have to document for Drupal 7, they are just in place for Drupal 8. So um, we, we try to, for example, in views, we never want to use view modes. And now in Drupal 8, well, uh, in Drupal 7, you can install display suite or a view mode module, or you can just declare the view modes in a hook. But in Drupal 8, it's like part of the site building experience that you can create your custom view modes to, to deliver a, a re reusable component um, of the content that you create. So that's, that's much better. Um, what I think is interesting is that the block system, not only on a conceptual level for the, like the, the APIs, um, so in Drupal 7, we use a lot of C tools content type plugins because they are like intelligent blocks um, instead of the, the stupid Drupal core blocks. And the Drupal 8 co uh, blocks are extensible in terms of code, but they are also extensible in terms of you in the UI can create your custom block types, um, which are fieldable. Um, so it's like, on our Drupal 7 sites, we all we usually create a teaser content type, and then we just use the teasers for parts of the like on the front page. We want to have a slider with some teasers, um, but they take up paths in the URLs. Um, so having a much more powerful block system solves a lot of uh, use cases for us. Um, but the custom block library for for especially for the content editor, it's a something that we have to explain them. That's it's like, it, and it's not so nice. I mean, there's an issue that, that deals with making the block UI a view so that you can customize it, but I think it hasn't been committed yet. So there's still some usability improvements to be made. Um, yeah. Site building, uh, usually, well, site building means uh, assembling a site, uh, so what we, traditionally do is we download a bunch of modules and build up the site, but in Drupal 8 you have to prepare for the obvious fact that a lot of contrib modules are just not ready. Um, there's lazy maintainers that never update the modules to Drupal 8, um, but the good thing is you can help them with the DA rules initiative, for example. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, but like lots of lots of Drupal 8 code is just not ready to be used, um, so you have to be creative. Have to find your own solutions. Um, <coughs> so what we, for example, do is Node queue uh, is not there, but we can almost simulate the Node queue with the custom block that has anti re entity references on it. Um, uh, yeah, SEO. Um, I updated this slide, so it's not, I, I did some work here, uh, I promise. Um, so because uh, in Los Angeles, Michael mentioned that meta there is nothing yet, uh, but actually the MetaTech module, if you find it on Bit Bitbucket, um, it exists and it's really usable. You just have to notice that 
when you enable the module, it does not do anything, uh, and you have to read the README. It's, it's a bit weird, I know, but um, when you read the README, it will tell you that you have to add meta tag field, and then everything is perfect. So you can already set your open graph, your Facebook uh, meta tags um, on the individual nodes with the meta tag module, and we are already using that in production, so that's super cool. Um, yeah. I don't know how much time um, your site builders will need, but um, from our experience, they really pick it up super fast. So if you have, especially if you have um, upwards compatible best practices in place in your, in your workflows, in your company, um, if basically the way that you're building Drupal 7 sites is the way that, that the community has decided we should go for in Drupal 8, then your site builders will pick it up super fast. That's it's also a really good experience so far. Um, configuration management, who is using the features module? Wow, cool, lots of people. Um, so the configuration management initiative, I have to be honest, I don't have so much experience. I've like tried it out, played around a bit. Uh, we don't have CMI as a 100% workflow in place for the websites that we built so far. Um, we are like experimenting with it. And <coughs> yeah, because we think it will be good, but we don't, we don't, we haven't needed it yet. So the, the continuous deployment of configuration, we kind of have uh, a process of just fixing it on live and stuff um, for the Drupal 8 site. So um, yeah. The problem, uh, what we have seen is like by evaluating CMI is that the, the, the tools, they are there, but there is no clear documentation yet available of how you can do it. Um, so yeah, the whole workflow is not perfect. Like there's the, the staging folder is a bit confusing. So there's currently an, an issue to, to do that um, or like to, to rename it to import export. The active folder, which should have the active configuration is empty, so that's also confusing, but that's the fact because active configuration has been moved into the database again. So you just have to prepare for, for some learnings there. Um, yeah, there's no way currently, or maybe there's already a config module, but there's no way to prevent those configuration changes. So you will basically, well, you can disable the permissions um, or you will have to prepare to, to merge them um, when you export them. So um, how does merging CMI changes work? Um, you just go to the Drupal Planet and you read the blog post by Pantheon from two days ago. Um, so there's, a, there's now a drush config merge command um, that is like a shortcut, but the, the basic workflow is similar to features in Drupal 7. So you always have to make sure that you export live, sorry, uh, that you export live first to uh, to the live branch, and then you uh, export on the dev branch, and then you merge them, or however you do it. Um, yeah, so far it has been a bit frustrating there, but a uh, good thing is, um, as being part of the community, we can fix it together. Yeah, so that's the tickets there. And you can find the slides online. So um, if you you just go to slides.com slash dasio or slash schnitzel, and then you can uh, dive into all of those tickets. Or you just join us tomorrow at Sprints, and then we can get all the, conf uh, the CMI tickets fixed. How about backend? So, um, <coughs> sorry, let me check my time. Okay, good. Yeah. So, mm, like my my role is is to work with all the different developers. Like we have front end, we have back end. We also have something that's site building, like clicking together stuff. Um, so, when when I worked for the for the SG, SGG project, um, Alex, the the main um, backend developer that was working on that project, he was really, really happy to see that 
uh, object-oriented code is embraced totally in Drupal 8. Um, we have much, much better fundamental APIs, thanks to Fargo, for example, um, who with their team, they worked on entity API, but also like the more abstracted um, metadata system in there, or the type, uh, like the type data system. Um, when we talked about blocks, they are all plugins, so you can create your own plugin types. Um, everything is extensible, replaceable. Um, so Drupal 8 really, by, um, by, base, by basing ourselves on the Symfony framework, we, we got a lot of best practices from the PHP world for free. So um, if you want to sell Drupal 8 to your backend team, um, you can tell them that they learn something they will need anywhere when they want to produce modern PHP code. So actually, that's the great thing. Like, um, I think when we hire Drupal people, we always know, uh, run into the problem that we don't have any, peop any people to hire because everyone is busy and the market is crazy. So um, now with Drupal 8, we can hire Symfony developers. We can hire other PHP developers. Uh, we can hire people from the university who have learned service-oriented architecture, who have learned uh, what inversion of control means, dependency injection, and so forth. So it's, it's just like, it's like we have been sleeping in, on our island in Drupal World for so long, and we have, great, we have developed great systems, like the hook system. Um, we have found very interesting solutions for module or like for architectural pattern problems uh, to organize our code. Um, so uh, my perception is that we keep the, the good spirit of the community, but we bring in the best practices to stay relevant for the next 10, 15 years. Um, that's what it's really about, uh, embracing Drupal 8. We can all stay on Drupal 7, but we will just not be relevant anymore in a couple of years, or maybe uh, some people are already laughing about <laughs> anyone that does Drupal 7 projects because of the, how the code is written. Yeah. So that also means that um, debugging Drupal 8 is a bit of a different experience, and we just worked on this last week when we found some issues with the routing system. It's just a bit crazy because you cannot just put uh, DPM statements anywhere and then think you will understand everything by just reading the code. Um, the system, because of the, the more advanced object-oriented patterns, it's just much, much more efficient to use an IDE, like we prefer PHP Storm um, or Eclipse or whatever, so that you can set breakpoints and step through the code and see how it's executed because it's not so much obvious anymore um, uh, how the execution chain, chain with like services being invoked um, really will flow through. So, yeah, that's the pitch for using a debugger. Make sure to, to use the right setup because otherwise it will just be, cr be frustrating for you. <coughs> yeah, and then documentation, like Drupal, I think, really does a good job at inline documentation. Um, all the methods are there, and you can read up a lot of change notices, but it's just a tedious work to do so. So in order to get the big picture and to, you kind of, right now you kind of have to follow the process of, of how Drupal 8 is developed in order to understand all the, all the consequences, um, or you have to read the code. There's no, no book about backend development for Drupal 8, as far as I know. Mm, yeah, but a good pointer is uh, go to the examples project. It's constantly updated with, with example code for Drupal 8. Um, so that's great. And if not, um, file an issue or ask, ask, ask a known developer if you can maybe, like while you are learning, you can also contribute to, to the documentation. And then you will also get a peer review if your documentation is actually right or if people have suggestions to improve your code. That's, that's also something that I uh, would encourage you to do so. 
yeah, and I've already mentioned that the non-Drupal developers, they will just understand what a service is, what a plugin is, what an event is, um, so understanding the architecture or talking about um, backend code is just easier. Um, custom modules. So, you know, like, it's not as simple as just writing a dot module file, um, but like, prepare to, to also embrace the, not only to be able to debug the Drupal 8 code, but when you write your own code, you should also follow those patterns and those best practices. And you can also do that already for Drupal 7, so there's there's way to do auto-loading um, in Drupal 7, for example. Yeah. And if you want to learn, um, you can join mentoring hours. Um, so there's like weekly hour mentoring hours on IRC, or you just go to a sprint where Ruben tells you all uh, how everything works. So that's also great. Front end. Um, who is a front ender? Who has worked with Drupal 8? Yeah, cool. So you guys must be in love. <laughs> it's like uh, every, the, the feel good mood and stuff. Like everybody is, in, especially in front end, is excited about the new templating system. Um, so traditionally in, uh, in, Drupal, in Drupal 7, we, we were using PHP template and it was sometimes just overwhelming so that uh, especially new front-enders, they didn't know if they should now use array syntax or object syntax to access stuff. Um, so the idea of Twig is that it's, it's a more unified experience and it's also better separation of concerns so we don't put database queries into the templates. Um, so it's a really good way of enforcing that separation and, and it's just much more prettier. Um, we we think that there's not really a, a need anymore for a contrib based theme because um, the theming system in Drupal 8 is a lot better and it has like a lot of more options there. Um, so for example, uh, you don't need the, the the devil themer module because you can just enable tweak debug and tweak debug will add all the comments that you need to understand which which templates were loaded, which uh, functions are there, um, which like template suggestions are there, so which, which overrides you can implement. So definitely check that out when, when developing that. Um, something that's really, really nice is that um, you can now selectively override markup. So uh, if you have a generic page template, uh, we often end up with duplicating all the HTML um, by, by writing an override page template. Um, and I think, yeah, we have an example for that. So if we wanna remove the H1 on the front page, um, so we have now, uh, like that's, that's the generic page template. Doo -doop, doo -doop. You can see it has .html, .twig, and I don't, see any code here, so that's cool. Like, um, there's, there's like some syntax that allows us to conditionally display a title here, for example. So that's what the, what the standard page template looks like. And the specific override, it's much simpler. We don't duplicate all the markup from the generic template, but we only say, okay, we are extending the page template and then we are overriding the block page title. And the block page title has been defined here. So all of this block can then get replaced by something else. So it's a really much more powerful tool that we don't, like traditionally we would have just copied everything and removed that one. But then we have to maintain this and this code twice or five times. So um, that's, that's something that that reduces the, um, uh, there's, a, there's a very intelligent word for that, but I just don't find it now. But it makes your code more maintainable. Um, the technical depth, yes. All right, cool. Um, upgrades. Who has worked on upgrading a Drupal 8 site? 
Would you like it? No? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> so the way we do up upgrades right now is um, we build the site again, and then we migrate. <laughs> so it's super, right? <laughs> um, there's, there's people that don't do it, like, or we do, we do it differently based on, uh, on, on a per project basis, but there's just so much, so much of the configuration system can still change because we don't have the, as they say, the golden beta yet. So we are like, how long do we have beta now for since Amsterdam? Yeah, so everyone thinks that, cool, we have a beta, but it's, it's, it's actually alphas all, <laughs> all over still. Um, so until we don't have all the upgrade pa uh, path blocker issues fixed, we, we still have to prepare for configuration to be broken when, up, uh, when upgrading. Um, and we just uh, worked on upgrading the amazylabs.com website. We will, uh, we will push that up in the next one or two weeks. And yeah, it's, it's a, like there the backend developer was not so happy because uh, <laughs> he had to write a lot of migrations and find a lot of fixes and yeah. So it's hard, before beta nine. So if you decided to use Drupal before beta nine, um, you're maybe stupid or you know what you do. And we are somewhere in between that. Um, yeah, um, but now um, um, intelligent people have decided to, to use head-to-head -head upgrades again. So after beta nine, um, by using the head-to-head -head upgrades, um, you should be fine or you can at least file a bug in there and, um, and we can upgrade it. So that's cool. So yeah. 